Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Hindi Project podcast. Today I was joined with my sister, Salma Hindi. We talked about a bunch of different things from male and female privilege in the haram <laughs> to uh, comedy to um, parents. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. It was interesting. We're here in Medina and we actually recorded it here. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Hindi Project podcast. Uh, this is the first time I'm joined with another Hindi. Uh, I'm with my sister, uh, Sanma Hindi. We're currently in Medina, in our hotel, having prayed Aisha prayer. Uh, we've been here for um, almost two weeks. No, by the end of it, we'll be here for two weeks, uh, having done Umrah and now come to Medina. So I thought we'd sit down and record a podcast while we're here and... Have a discussion. How are you doing? Fun times. Good. So for those who don't know, um, Sedma is uh, a comedian, comedian, aspiring comedian. Um, I was just going to say this. My mom gives a, my a look. My mom's in the room and she just gave me a dirty look. So now you know everything. Comedian uh, aspirations. Um, but it's interesting because... Uh, you know, when you're here, do you feel like that comedian side kind of like dies out? Because you can't um, like your mind can't be thinking about jokes while you're like here, can it? It's so weird. Well, OK, first of all, some of my duets are 100 percent for comedy. So um, like, for example, just making duet to like get better at the craft itself and to uh, improve my skill and, and, you know, to also have a bigger purpose with it. So like to reach larger audiences and to sort of like um bring happiness like to anybody who sees me and and also kind of like improve the impression that folks uh, or audiences have of muslim women um but then i also find that so yesterday i was thinking about how like last year because ramadan is really soon right it's in like two months right and last year i took like I consciously made the decision to completely take all of Ramadan off. So even when like Muslim events were asking to perform at like iftar or dinners or whatever, I said no. And because also, first of all, I didn't want to like get sidetracked by anything to do with comedy because it takes a lot of time to like prepare and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then also it's just really exhausting like to be fasting and and having to perform like the hour before iftar when you're super, like you're already lightheaded. And then... uh, but then it's during that time period where I completely like stopped using social media and, and stopped performing that I got like the most ideas or inspiration. <laughs> so it's weird because like you're like you're not thinking of jokes here. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. But then when you're when you remove all distractions and when you actually take a break from it, then you get like a lot more inspiration or ideas. Mm. Um, and actually, some comedians have told me it's the worst idea to completely like quit your your full time day job or stop your um like stop your your nine to five daily because then you're and lock yourself in your your house and just do comedy because then you're not gonna be receiving any like not necessarily inspiration but like sources yeah sources of like nothing's gonna be happening to you for you to like joke about and and my comedy is very much like this is what happened to me story this is you know what i right, mean right. so it, i'm probably gonna go back and then tell my friends about this trip and then come up with like five different <laughs> stories not intended though but yeah it kind of happens yeah exactly yeah i mean uh i don't know like sometimes when i think about it and i'm like uh if i were to be in your shoes and writing comedy the problem is like you start like analyzing people to like a degree that sometimes i think is just like not healthy you know what i mean specific people or like how do you mean not specific yeah specific people kind of like when you're going to the masjid and then somebody does something really weird and then like you're just like analyzing this person yeah and it's like is it healthy for me to be thinking about this person in this much detail like i don't even know them but yeah I can probably derive some good jokes out of this, but I'm like, also I'm doing it at the expense of someone yeah, who might be spiritually way better than me too. So I'm kind of like... True, true. Yeah. I guess, I don't know, it, it, it will play out more in terms of <clears throat> scenarios, less so than people, mm-hmm. like than this particular person that I start to fixate on. So for example, the story that I told you and Mama today, like of that lady coming into the haram and just like yelling at everyone and saying like... Do you want to repeat that story? Yeah, okay, so we're we're sitting and this was... Um, oh, I can't remember when. I think like uh, pre or post-Ost. 
prayer and then this lady came in everybody's just sitting and reading quran and stuff and this lady walks in and starts yelling at everyone like in arabic and she's like everybody fix your ruqwa you're doing your ruqwa wrong especially those of indian and turkish descent and she's just yelling. Yeah, everyone's looking at her and, and I'm she's like, yelling in arabic yeah. yeah i'm like first of all the people of indian turkish descent have absolutely no idea what you're saying <laughs> second of all it's just like wow like this lady genuinely thinks that what she's doing is right and that she's making a difference and she's changing things and then like after she said that I was like this is ridiculous this is racism whatever and then she left and then I was like but do they pray weird and I was like <laughs> looking at them after and uh but yeah so it's not it's not me being like oh my god this lady and start to like fixate on everything that she mm -hmm. does and whatever it's just like it's kind of like the whole scenario and the way it plays out and right. the people involved and stuff um but yeah sometimes I do think about like um, I don't know like what part of this is like backbiting or is this yeah. not right to say or whatever um, so for the most part like I try and like keep names out of it yeah. um, and then mostly it's like either scenarios that I experience or that like happened to me or yeah. like usually that's what I kind of talk about that's one of the issues like obviously like um, you and I had like long discussions before you even started your comedy about yeah. this and uh, I had reservations about a number of issues. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> I think what yeah, one of the issues is like is just from that perspective, like is it spiritually damaging? Yeah, you know, like you start to think about like I don't know, people just constantly probably are ex now expecting from you yeah um, jokes all the time. Yeah, and like you have to be on exactly. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I get like from my perspective, people see me and then they like expect me to. Be like religious. Be the sheikh role and, yeah, and like yeah. say hadith and, and stuff like that. And yeah. which is sometimes a stress, but also it's kind of pushing yeah. me in a good direction. So like I can't like be too upset with it. But then yeah. when it's constantly people pushing you to laugh constantly or to like yeah. joke and stuff, it's like yeah. sometimes you're like, No, like I need to cut this off. I need to I need to focus on myself. I need to, you know, yeah. work on my spirituality. And then the other issue is that will you ever be as funny as the funniest comedians yeah. if you have that like like boundaries boundaries or, mm. and like you know you talk about you want your heart to be like soft with a lust pen with the so maybe like joking all the time can't be like yeah yeah top priority you know understand what i mean like yeah it's I yeah i don't know it's weird because i look at it like i guess going back to earlier the duas that i made about it was like more specific about the craft itself like i look at it kind of as a, a job or like mm. a skill or whatever you would do and um, even though I really love it and it's super fun, but the second that it starts to get difficult or you have to like improve at it or whatever, um, it starts to kind of like become boring or whatever. And I realize that this is something that it, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, you're always gonna have to like kind of put in work to improve it. But yeah, that's, that's like a separate topic, but going back to what you said. So in order to like put in work to improve it, for example, one thing that they told us when we were first learning right to write comedy and stuff was watch a lot of comedy. Watch a lot of comedy as much as you can because the more you watch, the more you'll learn. Mm. You'll pick up like tricks and tips and, and even styles and you'll, you know, like you, yeah. you learn from watching. And so a lot of times like I'll force myself to watch like some Netflix specials and even like at comedy shows sometimes like if I'm in a hurry, I'll perform and leave. But mm. a lot of times I'll stay and I want to see, for example, other local comedians or their styles or what they do and whatever. Right. And then even when I'm at a lot of shows, like let's say I'm performing like three times a week or something and I'll perform and I'll stay and I'll feel like, wow, how much, how many hours am I spending like at comedy shows constantly? And this is like entertainment yeah. still, right? And so I'm like, is this a waste of time? I know in my mind, I'm like, um, I do it because I, I want to like learn. I want to see the, other people's styles. Mm -hmm. And I also want to support other comedians because like they remember if you're there and all that kind of stuff right. and sort of like make friends with people and network and whatever. But then another part of it is like, how much time are you spending at this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I, I'm always like struggling with. But I do find that when I take a break, um, it helps me come back like refreshed and help, helps me come back with a newer perspective. Yeah. Um, and then the thing about always being on, like, so because I, I'm pretty close with the same friends that, that I had pre and post starting comedy, um, mm. they've known me like they, 
they know me outside of the sphere of comedy. So if anything, I feel like my closest friends, they never talk to me about it because they're like, we see this all the time from you, like on stage and on social mm. media. So like, we want your the the real you kind of, or like the friend the friend version of you. Like right. they, they don't care for, for the, the off that. version. Yeah, the off <laughs> version, exactly. But then when I go to events where people like only know me as comedy now because of, of like rebranding myself or whatever. So for example, right. like a wedding, I went to a wedding in January and there was like guys and girls split and People just come up to me now and they're like, you should make a joke about this. I'm like, about what? <laughs> a wedding? Like, I don't understand. And then somebody else, like, uh, I don't know. I did something like I um, I forgot to pay the bill at my friend's, uh, like, dinner. And there was, like, like, 25 of us. And then I she paid and I, like, e-transferred. And she was like, this is going to make it into a bit, right? And initially, like, I, I was like, mm, I don't know. Like... <laughs> It's weird because people like almost not necessarily feel entitled, but they're like, this is this is something a funny situation, so a hundred percent is gonna be in your material. <laughs> I'm like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like, what's so funny to us, like hilarious, might not be funny to a bigger audience because right. like there's context, time, like there's so many things. Yeah. And then that kind of leads to the last point, which is um, constantly being on or constantly having to joke. If you do that and the the time the timing is not right or like there's no context or whatever mm. um then it takes away from it it's just like i don't know i'm a really big believer in like limited quantity and high quality as opposed to just like constantly right. putting out stuff which unfortunately i feel like you have to do if you want to get really well known on like youtube or social media you just yeah. constantly have to put out stuff and a lot of people looked at like i mean yes yeah, he's not here but he always yeah. tells me that so like people look at like the stats of like when you put out material what time yeah. day all that stuff but in the end, nothing matters to get traction on like all social media sites. Yeah. Whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Um, the only thing that gets traction is consistency of producing content. Yeah. That's it. Doesn't yeah, matter how yeah. good your content is. If yeah. you're just constantly posting. Yeah. Then you'll get likes. Yeah. And just, yeah, I don't know. That's something that I'm always like, should I always post? Should I always <clears> post? And then, um, but then to me, I'm like, I don't know. Just the pots. Oh. Okay, yeah, so we were talking about consistency. For, for everybody's, like, state of mind, we basically pressed pause and ate some food and then just yeah. unpaused yeah. right now. Okay, so. Because <laughs> I, I don't totally remember where we were at. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I was saying, you were saying that consistency is, like, the most effective <clears throat> way to, to gain a following. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't which, know. Which is terrible because then it's just, like, put out material, even if the material putting out is, like, boring or, exactly, or yeah. stupid or whatever. So I feel like I want to avoid that at any cost. Um, but then, yeah, the more you put out, the more you, you're able to hashtag, and then the more like somebody, like a big page, will come across your page and then like repost you and blah blah blah. Yeah. So or I don't know. I probably like everybody always says like put stuff out, do regular videos, do like YouTube, and I'm like mm. that's like I don't know. I find that because I don't know if I can like generate as much like content to be yeah. consistent with that, and then also like. That becomes like a full-time thing where you're just like focused so much on numbers and just like begging people to, to, to follow it, blah, yeah. blah, as opposed to yeah doing like trying to get better at the craft itself so mm. that's true it's a hard thing to balance yeah because everybody now says <clears throat> well it's not like it used to be you have to have a social media following and i used to think like my goal is to work in in the industry itself and like get as many opportunities as possible and then after that like the, the following will come but then everybody in the industry is like looks for people with the following looks for the social yeah. media following yeah. because that does like half the work <clears throat> for them or whatever yeah. so people who have like who are really big on vine or really big on youtube or whatever will get like really big i don't know like movie deals or ad deals or this and that or whatever because they have they already have the following to back them up kind of a thing yeah. so like they've built themselves up pretty much yeah. so it's complicated it is it's i guess it's affecting every industry i mean even with like the sheikh yeah. scene it's a, it's kind of similar because like there was the old way of doing things and it's like coming up slowly and having teachers and, and mm -hmm. you know slowly you know proving yourself in your community working in your community getting known in your community and then slowly like people getting to know you and then and now it's like with social media somebody can start like YouTube and like a year later they've got like this huge like following on YouTube even yeah. if they're not intelligent at all or and if what they're not, teaching they don't have is, like the credibility yeah exactly yeah. Like and if their character is terrible like sometimes 
I mean, you could you could present yourself in a certain way in social media, and like everybody will think you're amazing. And the reality yeah. is, your character is terrible. Yeah. Um, and then people find out their character is terrible later on, and, yeah, and, everybody, <laughs> and gets everybody gets shook. But it's like yeah. they, they were building this empire on just like yeah. I don't know, um, on nothing, right? Yeah. Um, so, but then it, it kind of works like now we're like to get the opportunities for the massage to invite you for conferences to invite you they they want to meet, they want you to have a following so that yeah so people can get excited so people can get excited and show up and stuff so yeah <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit i don't know i guess it's social i just read a tweet today it was saying social media is the worst is the worst of the industrial revolutions because it has not increased productivity in the world and at the same time all it's done is just created like significant problems yeah <laughs> there's a truth to that yeah i don't know everybody always says like it's a double-edged sword because then like you reach so many more people there's like interconnectedness blah, blah, but then blah, it's like how know. how many people do you really reach yeah i don't know yeah you know like how many people are you actually making a tangible difference on them yeah with your tweets or your you know, yeah, your, posts your, your posts or your videos. I mean, some of them for sure do, right? I mean, you think about some of the series out there, like Yes Shakadi's Sira yeah. on YouTube. I mean, that's really impactful, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But there's stuff out there that's really impactful. I'm just saying as a as a whole, when you look at the whole social media as a phenomenon, yeah. um, I think sometimes we exaggerate the, inf- the effect that it really it's has valid. on people. Yeah. yeah. I think it also has like given a platform to people to... I don't know, I guess, like, elevate their voices and talk and whatever, and and then there's no real way to, like, differentiate people's credibilities or expertise in said area mm-hmm. aside from the following that you have. Yeah. And then that could be based off of luck or based off of very super superficial things. Yeah. Um, or based off of, like, I don't know, it's... Yeah, so in that way, it's, like, hard to, to know what's what's credible and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, even, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't want to not to say anything yeah. about it about this, but like even like kind of even like podcasts, like a lot of people will, will do their own podcasts and stuff like that. And um, yeah. and it's kind of like, okay, are you just recording yourselves like talking or is it like, you know what I mean, for um, a purpose or to cater to a specific audience or who are the guests that you're bringing on, et cetera, yeah. that kind of stuff. So, well, the thing is about the podcast medium that I liked, yeah, even though like to be honest, I barely ever listen to podcasts yeah and then when the brothers came to me and they're like please start one please start one yeah i started to like just investigate out of like a research perspective and the thing that i liked about it was that it's in depth yeah i feel like when you go in super in depth like um, more things come out yeah more things come out and i think you can explore some interesting ideas there's still negatives to it i mean um i look at like guys like joe rogan and stuff and some of the stuff he puts out there man i'm like yeah it's just like a couple of non-intelligent people talking about a really complicated subject. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like oversimplifying it. Oversimplifying or? it. And they think they're like really talking about it. You know, yeah. especially when you talk about Islam. Like yeah. it's just, I'm like, I don't know what to do with this guy. Yeah. But. Um, that's, that, see, that's another thing. Like it's a big responsibility to be talking about complicated issues. And then yeah. you're really like, you can't be careless about it to bring yeah. on people who are not like either have lived experiences or are experts. Yeah, well, and I think, like, you have a responsibility. If you're bringing up an important topic, it doesn't have to be in, like, the single podcast that you're dealing with, but, like, if you bring up an important topic, one of your podcasts, you need to follow up on it, constantly yeah. talk about it, bring up different guests, different viewpoints, right? Exactly, yeah. um, but, like, the the issue I've seen with some of these podcasts is they're like, you know, we're willing to talk to anybody, we're open-minded, oh, we're yeah, willing yeah. to consider all opinions, <laughs> but then in reality, all of his guests on that topic are all the same people. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. So it's like you haven't really looked at all the perspectives you haven't really uh, entertained all the different possibilities so yeah um, the other thing is that I feel like podcasts are more of a guy medium kind of like YouTube I don't mm. know if that's true I think you're right like in terms of I don't know though but like a lot of my girlfriends do listen to podcasts um, but yeah the majority of them like a lot of them are held by men the only one I know of that like girls are really into modern love by the New York Times which is Mm. like more so about like relationships and and stuff like that but um yeah but yeah I think I think maybe you're right though I don't know much about podcasts either (laughs) that's the thing 
<laughs> that's the weird thing about this me starting it like not being like this like full out podcast person yeah but it's cool though because then like you'll learn along the way that's kind of how i felt with comedy like i yeah. didn't know much about it and then um and then i don't know like I, I find that there's there's some sort of value and wisdom into starting a new initiative or going into something completely naive because mm-hmm. then if you actually sat down and thought about <laughs> all everything that's out there and all the odds that are stacked against you and how you're way out of your league and people are Mm. so much more better suited for this than you are then like you're just never gonna start you're first of all you're already nervous about like starting and then second of all like once you know that okay who am i and everybody does this and there's no way i'm gonna stand out or whatever yeah then like you're not gonna do it it's true and actually like so i held myself back from like getting super into the the dawah especially on social media for many many years uh, there's a few reasons for that. Some was like some of my teachers were like, "Don't do it" and stuff like that. But also that perspective, where I was like, "There's so many other people doing it. Why yeah. would I step myself, s- set my foot in there, and I'm gonna definitely fail if I do it?" Yeah. And then as you're saying that, other people who are like way less credible, way less capable yeah, than you are, are like doing it and like exceeding. So then you're you're just like you just psyched yourself out of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, in in retrospect, I'm kind of happy I didn't as well because. You look back at yourself when you're younger, the way you would react to certain criticisms, the way that you would, um, the way that I would, anyways. I would react yeah. to criticisms or the way that I would have dealt with certain situations or my opinions on certain Islamic matters in the past yeah. would have been pretty shallow. So I'm kind of happy I waited yeah. till I was a bit older before I started like really engaging and putting my opinions out there, right? Yeah. Um, but you know what's interesting when, when you're talking about comedy like i think the major issue that i had with you getting into comedy besides like the obvious stuff which is like going to comedy clubs and being around people that i find unsafe yeah yeah. (laughs) uh beyond the obvious stuff is that you know you ever see that i think it was dave Chappelle, and he was talking about how like um they made eddie murphy wear a dress and then they made Martin Lawrence wear a dress. Did you ever see that? No. Was this like in a in a stand up? I think one of his stand ups he talked about that. Okay, I haven't watched any of his old stuff. Yeah. yeah. The worst. <laughs> but yeah. It's probably in one of his old stuff. And then I also saw someone talk about that too on a TV show once. Yeah. About how they always try to put like the black guy in a dress. Interesting. So I think the reason behind that was that like in the psyche of white America. Yeah. The black guy is dangerous. The yeah. black guy, you walk down the street, you see a black guy, you want to like... You have to make him less intimidating you have the to, audience. Like, exactly. Mm-hmm. So they want to put him in the dress and kind of like emasculate him. Yeah. Because not just it makes him less scary to the audience, it like, it clashes these two, these two like concepts in their heads, right? Okay. Yeah. So it's like, hey, here's this scary black guy, but also we put him in a dress, yeah. like, you know, like a cross dresser. Yeah. And it's like these two... Com- Competing stereotypes clashing against each other, yeah. and they don't even, it doesn't even matter what they say. It's just that concept becomes like super funny. Yeah. But in the process, they've emasculated the, these black guys. Yeah. Right. And so like Dave Chappelle was talking about how like terrible that is, and then like this other show kind of talked about it, and it was the same thing. Like basically like how they were asking this black guy to wear a dress, and he was like, "No, I saw what you guys did to Eddie Murphy. I saw what yeah, you guys yeah. did to Marlon. Earth. I'm not going to do that." Yeah. And they were like, "Why? It's just funny. Like, who cares, yeah. right?" But they didn't understand the context behind it. Yeah. So here's my thing: is that when you become the hijabi comedian, yeah, the hijabi in the mind of like white America, married America, is the super religious, yeah, super oppressed, oppressed yeah. a girl, and then what are they going to want to? what's what's the what's the dress for you to wear yeah what's the contrast yeah so the contrast to that is probably you being incredibly vulgar yeah um you know doing jokes about like sex and, mm-hmm. and cursing and stuff like that yeah. that those two clashing my mom's giving another dirty look <laughs> <laughs> continue yeah but those two clashing even if your jokes are not funny yeah if you're just because they did this with women comedians in general right? yeah like people like sarah silverberg and others like just Amy, having a woman Amy comedian being really vulgar was hilarious. Yeah. Now imagine a woman hijabi yeah. being really vulgar would be like even more hilarious. Yeah. Even if the jokes aren't funny, just the concept. Yeah. But in 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 the process of doing that, it's like they're still exerting their will over you. Yeah. And they're still not seeing you as a person and, and not considering your jokes yeah. intellectually. It's just 
their wills on you kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen this, by the way. There is an Australian hijabi. Yes, I know. I, you know? I was going to actually mention that because I watched her, her video, but yeah. And she's vulgar. Yeah, she's super vulgar. It was like... And I'm like... Yeah. But that's exactly what that is. It doesn't matter how... Her jokes could be the least funny. They're going to f- laugh at it like crazy. Yeah. Because it's just those two concepts just like... Yeah. Coming together and... Yeah, that's like super yeah. shocking or or just like really going against the norm in their heads. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's something that I think about too that because I'm really skeptical of... I, I don't know. I, I know that you're supposed to be like, oh, you know, you see yourself succeeding no matter what. If there's a will, mm. there's a way, whatever. But I, I do have all of this in mind and I'm really skeptical about just how far... Uh, Muslim hijabi woman can possibly go mm-hmm. in the media entertainment industry yeah. without succumbing to these types of without like wearing the dress or without um, right. basically doing what the producers ask you to do or whatever and uh, obviously I've never experienced any of that yet because with stand up it's 100% in your control what you talk about and what you right. do but I think as you move up and there's going to be more situations where they'll definitely tell you like don't say this or for, it'll probably start by saying like take out this content or don't do that or whatever right. and then it'll you know progress further by saying like why don't you explore this or why don't you do yeah, that exactly. or whatever and then they'll say like and then it, depending on like what kind of opportunities like if you're on tv or if you're on whatever then then they'll they can like straight up tell you like wear the dress or whatever yeah. um so i don't know like i i am really <clears throat> skeptical right now about how i could possibly like even in acting or if you look at non-traditional um american white american looking actors so for example somebody like mindy kaling or aziz ansari and those people i'm like every time hollywood wants to cast a person of color as a main actor they overcompensate by overly sexualizing their their character right or um or making them like you know Mindy Kaling only dates white guys in all of her episodes right. same with like Haziz Ansari and um, because to, to the white audience they're like this is too threatening we can't fully accept them as part of us yet so like okay we're gonna we're gonna make them we're gonna really like whitewash their lifestyle or whitewash yeah. their whatever their taste in, in the dating pool or, or that kind of stuff but I think that that's this unfortunately the stepping stone to now be like okay we accept uh, POCs we've seen them before w- w- whatever now we don't need like the sexual the over sexualization of these mm. characters now we can move on to like more complicated like black or, or or people of color and stuff right and so like I do have hope that it's getting does that better, happen but- though or does it just become like okay we used your utility and yeah. now we'll just move on to the next minority because you're yeah. not interesting to us anymore um <clears throat> I mean probably both but I think that now that the audience has finally seen, I mean, it's kind of kind of like women getting into film and, or the entertainment industry too. In the beginning, like mm. they had to fit just one particular character, and then later on, they're like now as we get more and more accustomed to it and more used to it, they can explore much more complicated roles or much more, mm. I don't know, like nuanced roles and stuff. So I feel like hopefully that's the scene that I want to like enter in <laughs> uh, on, and not necessarily like otherwise. Otherwise, like if it completely contrasts um and it's like no you have to wear the dress or whatever then i would have to like turn down that opportunity and have to say like okay well i can't do it but obviously from a spiritual perspective it's like okay but are you even going to recognize that's what it is um are you even it's not going to be like an all of a sudden thing like sentiment do this it's it's going to be like yeah like (laughs) basically like they're step by step and it's you're not really going to be aware of it so it's it's kind of scary in that sense because I don't know. Here's the thing: because of the the Muslim community is like super, they're super reserved about this topic, and they they do have reason to be and stuff. Mm. Um, but because of that, nobody approaches there, even touches like this area, mm. and so it's kind of like I find myself on my own, having to be my own moral compass in like this environment that just is the complete opposite of that right yeah. so i have to be the one to tell myself like listen i know it's like funnier if you were to just like swear or say this word or whatever but like but don't try and think of another way put in like that much more effort to try and drive home the same message mm. with like with the same level of creativity or, or whatever without using a crutch which is what swearing and vulgarity right. is anyways to comedians yeah. the interesting thing though is that i think 
at least the community in Toronto, because they're so like open minded and progressive and stuff, they actually want you to sort of like be complicated and rebel and speak to um like I don't know, I guess like for lack of a better word, like the revolution or whatever. Like they want mm-hmm. you they want you to to call out like the white man and to call out their privilege and to call out whatever and all that kind of stuff as opposed to like make fun of your own people and you know, uh right. whatever. Like to them they they would rather that um because it's kind of like a shared experience uh, mm. between like people of color or uh, other marginalized communities downtown. Yeah, I don't know if that sells on the mainstream. But. Yeah, that's the problem though. Is that like, yeah, the issue is that it might not sell on the mainstream. Um, but for example, this uh, comedy show that I was part of in January called Shade. Um, it was like the entire audience was just like all people of color, color LGBTQ uh, women, and it was just like everybody there just a hundred percent supported like all of this type of comedy and they hated anything like i remember one point saying something like how mosques um uh like they like lock women in the back or something like that something about misogyny or whatever and everyone was like no like when they're not having it they don't want you to talk anything bad about your community no stereotypes (laughs) nothing whereas a white audience would have been like amazing yes (laughs) make fun of your people more um Mm. because we get threatened and uncomfortable when you like try and turn it around on us right Right. so but and but that's the biggest comedy show i've ever been part of there was like 400 people in the audience Mm. um all other comedy shows that are held by the mainstream and held by like these like white men producers or whatever there's only like maximum like 20 people in the audience or whatever do you know what i mean so it's interesting because the numbers are there but just like the opportunities and avenues and the people who hold the power are are not there so Mm. i don't know it's (laughs) it's it's something definitely like that i think about but as of now i haven't been able like haven't had to encounter it but i do know for sure that as you move up and if there are more opportunities then just in general even like dave Chappelle talks about with his show and whatever how they tried to like control him and that's why he left right um like they they all they're always gonna be like we're paying you so you have to do this do you know what i mean and then the second it gets to that, it doesn't even matter how much money. It's just like, okay, well, I feel undignified yeah. because you're you're controlling me or you're treating me like a, an animal or a puppet or whatever, right? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, it's like, it can go up and down the list of all the negatives, but yeah. Muslims are constantly complaining that, like, we're not telling our own stories. We have to tell our own stories. Yeah. And people in the arts. But then as soon as somebody gets into the arts, you're like, yeah, there's a lot of haram in Yeah, there. you're like, mm, leave it. <laughs> Which Just... there is a lot of haram in there. But how do you how yeah. do you break out of that? How do you create the narrative for us it's, it, and the way for other people? That's the yeah. that's the question. Because right now there is no way. I was speaking to another sheikh. I will not mention his name because okay. I don't want to out him. Okay. <laughs> his brother yeah. is a comedian. Yeah. Um, but his brother is like a comedian like not a muslim comedian okay. you know what i mean like yeah, he's just yeah, like yeah. a comedian yeah yeah right it just happens to have a muslim name that's all yeah but like totally and that's the problem is like everybody who goes down that road just either goes straight into like the mainstream and like but that's the thing if you really don't have the, the support of your right. community then you just completely cut yourself off from it yeah like you just and that's why i'm so fascinated when i find muslim comedians in the industry very rare who still adhere like to the practices of islam i'm like Mm. i want to know your story is anybody Mm. supporting you how many people do you have blocked on facebook from your family (laughs) like i need to know the answers to all these questions because i want to know how closely do you adhere to it is it just something that you use because like you're just part of your identity by autopilot or is Mm. it a conscious choice do you know what i mean like these are the kinds of questions i want to know um but there's so few of those, right? Yeah, that. But but the thing is, like, yeah, if it, if there was way more Muslims in it, then and there was support, then they wouldn't have to just completely like leave their their yeah. community behind. Um, okay, I remember when I first started doing it uh, comedy regularly, which was around last year this time. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a show last April, and uh, and and I told my friends to come out to it, and at that time, everybody was like so excited still because it was new and stuff. Yeah. So literally this show, like 25 of my friends came to it and um, and they made up the entire audience. There was only three other people aside <laughs> from my friends who were there, right? Wow. So 
This is a room, uh, like a, a comedy show, a room filled like 95% all Muslims. And the comedians were just like so confused. <laughs> so I remember initially when, when I first performed that second city and it was kind of like the same situation, except the, the there was like 120 audience members. So let's say my friends made up like 50 of them. Um, th- there was still a lot more people. And uh, I remember my friend telling me like, Sanma, this is amazing because not only like are you bringing muslims or muslim stories to the stage to mainstream audiences you're bringing muslims to places that they traditionally would not have been to right Mm -hmm. and i was like uh why is it a good thing when i'm dragging muslims to hell with me (laughs) like i didn't understand right and then at this show um the one where like 25 of my friends are muslims and there's only like three other audience members um the comedians go up one of them goes up and uh, he's i don't know like everybody starts doing like white people jokes all super vulgar relationships whatever none of us can relate none of us are laughing okay mm-hmm. then like a, a, a one comedian goes up and it was she was the first one to address this and she was like um does anybody here like can anybody here relate and she says something so vulgar about like having a one night stand with somebody and we're all just like uh nope I actually cannot relate. And then she was like, anybody here? Uh, okay, you know what? Let's try another joke. And she was like, anybody here uh, smoke weed? And then the audience is quiet. And then one person from the audience was like, we're not going to tell you if we do. Or something like that, right? And then somebody said something like, she said, I don't even know. Anyways, then she was like, okay, let's just pretend. And then she like took us on this trip. And then and then she went off and then the next comedian came and then he made a, a Muslim joke and everybody like lost it. Like he was saying how he was saying like Canada should bring in more refugees because like for majority of the year we have our faces and hands covered anyway. Something <laughs> like that. Right. And then another comedian came up and he just was going through his bits. He's like, what about this one? You guys do this. What about this? You guys do that. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like these comedians pros, one of them. um, is an actor on CBC's The Working Moms and stuff. Like, oh. absolute pros come to a room filled with Muslims, and I'm like, oh, you think you're a pro now? <laughs> How are you going to be able to handle this audience, right? And they had to be like, okay, what can I cater to them? What do they do? What do they not do? They don't drink. Okay, I can't make drinking jokes, which is like 100% of my material. Okay, they don't, like, you know, have sex before yeah. marriage. I can't make all these jokes or whatever, right? Yeah. And so in that way, like, when Muslims take up these spaces, we're kind of like demanding now um, for you to cater to us. Like th- that's just mm. how a show is. If that right. you can ignore us and <laughs> talk to the three people in the room, but then your show is just going to be horrible, right? Yeah. And so, uh, like as a performer, comedian, you're trying to appease t- to the majority. And so, I don't know. In that way, that was like the first time where I was like, wow, it's actually true that if, if like you take up space and you you come into these places, then they have to acknowledge you and they have to be like, yeah. okay, how do I, you know, initially like, I can't say like racist jokes. I can't be blah, blah, blah. I can't be this and that, but nobody really does that anyways anymore. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like now it's, it's also like, well, I can't just do vulgar jokes. I can't just do this anymore because right. of what like they relate to. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, it's still it but i still think about how you know um like for example i'm part of the facebook group of like toronto comedians there's maybe 1200 members on there or something and uh it's a closed group and sometimes i'll look at postings that people put up like i need a a headliner i need somebody to do this that or i need somebody to do whatever and like it literally says must be okay with smoking two joints and like you know whatever getting paid in in drinks must be okay and i'm like oh what in what world is this it's just to me i'm like 100 percent. i don't fit in here i don't fit in here i don't you know what i mean like as i look through all this stuff like there's maybe three comedy groups or places that i know i can go to constantly because they're like safe places or whatever and those are usually ones that are run by women because you know they've been excluded a lot by by like men or or they they've had to face a lot of like racist sexist jokes whatever and so they've made their own spaces um Mm. so yeah that's like it's a constant reminder always like you are a minority you don't fit in here you know what Mm. i mean like the and a lot of times i'll meet muslims who um like drink and do all that stuff so they're okay with it and Mm. and i'm like okay well it's kind of like the workplace if you don't demand to take aid off or if you don't demand for there to be an enemy or if you don't demand for these 
things that you need for your religious accommodations then mm. they're just never I, it's never even gonna occur to them you know what right. i mean so it's interesting yeah well, well we talk about accommodation and we're here in medina yeah <coughs> just came back from mecca yeah we've been having like this uh kind of counting the tools of <laughs> <laughs> female privilege versus male privilege you know? yeah let me tell you, male privilege is always winning. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. You, you guys had some pretty good ones, though. Okay, we had a couple. Um, but it's only because <laughs> we were controlled by men. So, okay, I don't know. Do you want to start telling them okay, about some? So the one main one is that yeah. when we go for, when you go to Masjid Haram right now, it's been like this for a few months, as far as I know. Um, I think because of the construction they're doing to expand the Zamzam area. So the main area of the Kaaba, so what they call the Sahan, which is the main ground floor where people do tawaf, they have restricted that uh, to everyone except those who are doing Umrah. So you can't go in unless you're wearing a haram. Now, the issue is that you can only really tell if a man is wearing a haram. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if a woman's wearing a haram, you can't really tell. So we went, we did Umrah, we all went in there. And then the next day, of course, I'm out of my haram and, and you wanted to go for a tawaf. Yeah. You could go and I couldn't go. Yeah. I'd have to go to the first level, which took like at least double the time. Yeah, because yeah. like the circumference is so much bigger. Yeah. Um, basically, the guy was like, I want to ask, is there any possible way that we could go to do tawaf on the main level um, without wearing a haram? And he's like, just go through the haram door. And I'm like is that the only way and he's like you're a woman they're not gonna know and i was like what <laughs> female privilege in a muslim country i am shook and then um what else i think i feel like that's the only privilege we encountered then let me tell you about the male privilege in the entire haram so because of all the construction there's so much drywall that's like covering um our, our, I guess your view from the Kaaba from inside like where you pray and stuff like that so for some reason any remotely Kaaba viewing area is like closed off for men so you can for kind women. of like lounge there for like you, you lounge it's closed there. off for women no like if it's a viewing area right then only men can see it yeah so it's yeah. closed off for women yeah. so like it's a it's a co-ed lounging area but when it uh, comes for prayer like the guards will come and they'll be like okay women get up get up leave and any place the only place where you can like sit in the haram if you're a lady is any place where you can't see um the kaaba and mm -hmm. i remember like except for this one place that i found on the first floor blessed and i like went to <laughs> i i found it i went back to it um i think on our last day there and uh around fedger time is like the best and then i saw women and men sitting there and i was like oh no <laughs> this looks very <laughs> traumatically familiar they're gonna kick the women out right like two minutes before fetch so i went to the guard and i was like who are you kicking out from here i need to know the gender that's getting discriminated against and which one is getting privileged and they were like um he was he was like i don't know i was like our women, women are staying right and he was like uh go talk to that officer so i asked him i was like women are staying right i was like desperate <laughs> and he was like yeah yeah don't worry and then the time came like for him to kick out whichever gender and he was like all right men get up and he kicked all the men out and i literally had like the smallest like evil <laughs> smile i mean i feel bad i don't want anybody to get kicked out but I mean, if they, I want the men to get kicked <laughs> out. <laughs> so, but yeah, I don't know if there's, oh yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Medina privilege. Um, so basically the Rauda in, in uh, Masjid al-Nabawi is w like used to be closed off for women except for one hour during the 24 hours of the day. And men have access like all the time. And then now they, they've increased it to, I think like six hours so two hours after i had two hours after austin and two hours after um fedj but basically it's still like they don't open the entire thing for women they only open like a, a small section of it and mm. then uh the men get like the rest of the time so ibrahim had to like went this time and he experienced waiting and he was like excuse <laughs> me what is do you know what gender I am? How can you subject me to this? That's not gender is. It's, no, you know what? Because, like, I can't... The last time... I, well, yeah, obviously, I came for Hajj, but the time before that... Um, but Hajj, I couldn't come to the Rauda because I was doing, like, these passport stuff, and I was in the passport office for, like, a few days. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
the last time before that I came was the year before I got engaged, I think. So it was almost like nine years ago or something oh, like that. Wow. 10 okay. years ago. And at that time, like getting into the Rolda was not that hard. Yeah. And I remember one time um, they would actually, they closed the Rolda to clean because like they closed the message to clean. So, and I came right before they opened it and there was like just me and like 20 other people. Yeah. We walked into the Rolda and we were there for like as long as we wanted. Yeah, you're like lying like, down and like, like everything's yeah, fine. It was yeah. so, so amazing. And now it's like the amount of people that come, I guess successively year after year, like it's just gone up. Yeah. And it's like people are herded in like, like cows. Yeah. And like literally, they bring them into like one pen, yeah. and they hold them there, and then they like open that pen up, and they run, and and they stampede, and it's like it's and people are elbowing each other. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. That's how so, it is for women, like always. But yeah. um, well, I went there, and I was like, I went at like twelve thirty at night yesterday, and then yeah. I went to the guard. I was like, when is it like empty? He's like, yeah. this is it empty. Yeah. <laughs> this is the empty version yeah. of the old. I was like, okay. <laughs> I guess like just because of population or numbers why is it starting to even out yeah. for everyone but i mean i would still scale this towards <laughs> male privilege um aside from that i don't know if there's anything else oh yeah we went to the mall yesterday and then you had to walk through the metal detector and we walked <laughs> oh yeah that was the yeah. he was like uh, we're walking into the mall and then he was he told my mom and sister he's like you guys go through like normal entrance yeah. and then i had to go through like the metal detector yeah like, okay i don't know why which is weird because we have more things to like hide <laughs> i know in. you guys have like purses and stuff and i was like empty-handed yeah. but whatever yeah yeah so there's some interesting stuff here men and women but like the worst was when i went for hedge yeah. and so one guy on our group wanted to go straight to throw their jamarat oh yeah, yeah and um so he walked from our camp he took his wife she was tired too he was like come with me because we walked, okay, so we walked originally from Muzdalifa all the way to Mina. Yeah. And we got to Mina and I was just exhausted. Muzdalifa like, to Mina? Yeah. How it was long like, was that? It probably took like two hours to walk it. Oh my God. Or something. Yeah. So we got there. We're pushing, each of us were pushing wheelchairs. Oh my God. Because there were some older people and they couldn't stay. Yeah. And they were tired and, and the buses had, uh, they closed the, usually you send the old people on buses to go right back to the camp so they don't have to spend the night in Muzdalifah if it's too t- tough for them yeah but by the time we got to Muzdalifah it was so late they had already closed off all the roads and we couldn't yeah. send the older people so then I was like what are we going to do I said okay fine let's just go walking so me and a couple of people we went walking pushing um, wheelchairs all the way back to Mina we get there obviously I got there I was like so exhausted my feet were killing me and I was just like I'm yeah. done I'm falling asleep right now and it's like when did you guys go in the morning in the morning oh God, so morning, 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 morning yeah, before before Fedge Okay. Basically. We missed Fedge and Mosetta Fedge. Yeah. Anyways, so then we got there, and then um, he was like, I want to, I just walk two hours. Yeah. I'm going to walk an extra hour yeah. and throw the Jamarat and then take off my haram. Right? Yeah. Like he was just like, I'm, I'm done with my haram. I want to yeah. get out of it. And he convinced his wife to go with him, even yeah. though she walked the two hours yeah. too. So she said, okay. And they walked the extra hour. They threw the Jamarat. He said that part was fine. But um, they had closed the road for him to get back um to where our tent was yeah and they rerouted them in a certain way and basically we went through the reroute and he ended up on the street yeah and he has minimal english so he didn't really know how to get back yeah um and so what ended up happening is they got lost for hours it's confusing anyways it's, I mean, it's very like really confusing. confusing yeah yeah even myself <laughs> even myself After you know being able to read day. all the signs and everything yeah. I still keep going up to every police officer I see, and I'm like, am I going the right way? Yeah. It's, it can be confusing. Um, yeah, so he got totally lost for hours yeah. after the three hours of walking is already done. Oh my God. <clears throat> they were like at Zohar time, so now the sun is like right out. This is yeah, August. Amazing. This is like 50-something degrees outside. Yeah. Um, you know, these countries, they like stop telling you the temperature after 50-something. Yeah, because of like worker rights. They have like labor laws yeah. that once it hits like 55, people... G- can go off work yeah so they're so basically, like we never ever go above 50 <laughs> that yeah. for some reason the climate never goes yeah. up like over 55 so yeah <clears throat> who knows how hot it was it could have been yeah. 60 or something but like they're oh, stranded yeah. so his wife now is getting dehydrated right so um so he tried to stop you know around the jamarat is like where you get all the vip tents and stuff right yeah so he finds this VIP tent for like some of the Gulf countries like Qatar or, du- or Dubai and the like yeah. Emirates and all that stuff. And he goes up to them and he's like, you know, can and they have like these shaded like entrance areas and yeah. guards at the front. It's like full VIP, right? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I won't gonna go into the, all the <laughs> VIP details, but so he goes to the guard and he's like, yo, my wife is like dying here, right? She's dehydrated. She's like dizzy. She's fainting. Can she just, can we just sit 
f- under the shade for like a few minutes for her to like recover. Yeah. And then they're like, sorry, this is men only. Oh like, like, she's gonna die. Like, can, can we do something for her? Can like, just make sure she and dies? They're just like, women. yeah. <laughs> oh <my laughs> just make God. sure she dies among women. So, yeah. So then he, by the time he found his way back, like, she was, she was yeah, out of it. And all the women had to like help her for hours. And, yeah. Like, basically pour ice on her and yeah, give yeah. her like so much to drink. Oh my gosh, she needs like an IV. And she stayed in, yeah, she stayed in a wheelchair for like a few, couple of days by the time she felt better and stuff. Oh so. my God. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just cultural I, I feel like at that conflict, point. It's, it's not, totally cultural. It's not, it's not religious. It's totally cultural. Yeah. I mean, you feel like conflicted with this whole like feminism versus the women rights things. I'm supposed to give a khutbah on women's rights in Masajid when I get back from oh, the yeah. Queen Institute. That we're doing something on it. Yeah. But it's like you feel this conflict because you know some people are using this like feminism thing to like as a vehicle to bring in like their own western liberalism into and subject islam to it kind of thing Mm -hmm. but then on the other hand you're like but there's things we do to women that are not fair yeah yeah. you know and it's not like allah specifically told us you have to do this yeah if allah told me you have to do this then i don't care what anyone says i'm gonna do it yeah but if allah didn't tell me that i have to do that then why am i doing it yeah that's a thing like i i mean this is not this is about me seeing the Kaaba and not me dying in a tent but like just about but still like yeah just about that seeing like, the Kaaba I was like where in the Quran does it say only men can pray in the areas where they can see the Kaaba like yeah. I was genuinely thinking about that I was like that's not fair like what would the prophet do if he was here like how you know what I mean yeah. like uh, and and if it's like if it's that like I'm obviously separating the genders and praying separate this is important yeah but then okay why don't we give like the women the top level yeah and the men get the other two levels or yeah. whatever, right? Like, you, you, could always, you could always figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Because seeing the Kaaba is, like, for me, it's the most exciting thing about Exactly, yeah. And praying when you see the Kaaba is so powerful. Exactly, so yeah. So I get that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the other issue is people are like, well, women are falling for these different ideologies. And it's like, but we're not helping them build their spirituality either. Yeah. It's interesting uh, the point that you mentioned. And, I mean, me, myself, <laughs> like, I'm kind of struggling between trying to differentiate between, like, okay, what is actually STEM and what has just been taught to you through an insanely heavy patriarchal uh, perspective mm-hmm. in terms of, like, culture and whatever. And uh, and then, and like, what part, like, what should you reject, what should you take or yeah. adopt and whatever. And I don't know. It's tough because, like... <laughs> Like, I don't know. Unfortunately, a lot of times, like, you can't look up to our, our shuyukh or our scholars to, like, objectively say, like, okay, you know, let's make things more accommodating to women or let's, you know, mm-hmm. um, like, consider just fairness. That's it, you know, right. or, or whatever. It's not even um, about, like, equality or because, you know, at the end of the day, it's the Islamic belief that, okay, there are differences in the gender too, though, right? Right. And so... And that's something that, you know, people would say is not progressive because gender is a social construct and, uh, you know, yeah, all all that kind of, exactly all that, like, liberal stuff. And, I mean, that's that's the part where you say, like, okay, no, like, I believe religiously that, um, uh, like, there is a difference and all of that. But, um, I don't know, so so it's kind of hard because when you go to like these liberal spaces you're like i can fully be embraced and we can hate on men for all the trauma <laughs> and everything that they put us through and then but then you're like okay but you know i'm also like religious and what what does sim say and there are still codes of conduct and i don't know like um i don't know for example like even me among my friends will be like okay aesthetically i'm gonna do whatever i want i can work i can this and that i can all that kind of stuff and then when, when you, if you get a guy who's like, okay, I'm not going to work or like you're going to pitch in, we're like, excuse me, <laughs> do you know your rights <laughs> towards me? You need to provide everything. And so it's like, are you picking and choosing or right. do you know what I mean? So I don't know. It's um, it's it's definitely something that is, I think, the biggest struggle of of the identity of Muslims in the West in particular. Yeah. Um, and even probably globally, because globally people might just be following all the rules in like Saudi Arabia or whatever but in secret being like I reject everything about this religion uh, because of this country and because of you know what I mean right. and so I don't know it's some, I always think about like my non-existent children and how to like bring them <laughs> up being like respectful in, in a liberal 
country, a liberal yeah. sec- a secular country, but also like having a strong understanding and like belief in in their religion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but at some point, I feel like we have to push back against some of these narratives too. Because I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, you feel like the right hates us because we're Muslim. Yeah, and then the left is willing to accept us as Muslims, but leave your Islam at the door. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. you keep your Muslim identity. Yeah. Call in your culture. Yeah, because that's marginalized. Yeah, but you can just keep that Islam thing at the door, right? Yeah. Because um, a lot of these are like anti power structures, but yeah. then religion to them is also power structure. Yeah. Right? It's true, yeah. So, I don't know. Did I tell you? Did you read my post about like, when I went to this university and this, this kid, like, no? No, when was this? Okay, okay. so I posted on Facebook a little while back. I went to. A university yeah and i didn't mention this in the post but somebody afterwards like you really should have mentioned this part in the post yeah it wasn't a girl it was a guy yeah who basically confronted me after the talk yeah and was like islam is patriarchal like islam is yeah. inherently patriarchal okay and i was like why would you say that yeah and the example that he gave me was look prophet ibrahim when allah told him to slaughter his son in the Quran, he goes to his son and he tells him, what do you think? I see this dream that I'm slaughtering you. What do you think? Yeah. And then when Prophet Ibrahim decides to leave Hajj and Ismail in the desert, he takes them to the desert. He leaves them there. He didn't say, what do you think, though? In the Quran, he says, he said, what, oh, do, okay. what do you think about this? Okay. And then Ismail says, if uh, Anmat yeah. as God has commanded you. Okay, so when he leaves, but when he leaves Hajj and Ismail in the desert, he doesn't, he doesn't ask her you know yeah. permission he doesn't seek her opinion he just leaves her and walks away so look at look at the way he's treating this woman look at the way he treats you know the boy's son right yeah he seeks the opinion of his son but he doesn't seek the opinion of, of the woman right and i'm like I, like at first i was just like staring at him like i don't even know where to start with you yeah right? that's so like nuanced how do you even i was like yeah like how do you even know the islamic texts to that yeah. detail to come up with this argument yeah but like miss the major point behind yeah. all of these is the scripture right yeah. so then i started breaking it down to him i'm like listen yes the opinion of ahlis sunnah jama'ah that the ru'ya the dream of the prophets are wahi and they're haq that's according yeah. to the companions right so they are they are revelation and they are truth but the nature of a dream is that it requires interpretation yeah so when yusuf salam, sees the dream of the sun and the moon and the stars mm-hmm. bowing to him he goes to his father he asks his opinion because yeah. you need to interpret it, right? Yeah. Even the prophet would receive dreams sometimes. He's not sure. He would have an interpretation. He would not be sure if that interpretation was true. Yeah. And then when it would happen, then he knew that his interpretation was true, right? Yeah. So it requires interpretation. So Prophet Rahim seeing the dream of him slaughtering his son, he doesn't know if Allah is actually telling him to slaughter his son or not. Yeah. So he goes to Ismail, tells him, what do you think? Because he wants to know, am I interpreting it the right way or not? Yeah. And his son tells him, yeah, do it. This is what God is telling you to do. Yeah. But him leaving Hajar in the desert, clearly it must have been order. direct order, right? Because yeah. she tells him, Allahu amaraka biha, that mm-hmm. God order you to do this. And he says, Naam. He says, yeah. yes. Like it's definitive, God told me to leave you here. Yeah. Right? And then subhanAllah, her response is the most beautiful response. Mm-hmm. She says, Idhan la, yu, la in, that, in that case, Allah is not going to cause me to be lost. Yeah. Which is that if you follow the rules of Allah, Allah is not going to cause you to be lost. Yeah. Even if he's leaving you stranded in, in a desert. Yeah. Right? So, which is the whole point is that even sometimes when we follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do, yeah. sometimes it might feel like it's unfair. Yeah. Sometimes we feel like our you know, hands are tied behind our back. Yeah. Like you're competing in comedy, but you can't take all these jobs because yeah. like they're paying you in beer and stuff. Yeah, like you yeah. feel like your hands are tied behind your back, yeah. but you know in your heart you're doing something for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going gonna, is gonna to help you. He's going to aid you. He's going to you know, bring you your yeah. risk anyways, right? And Allah gave them zamzam like right out of the water. And yeah. Then, SubhanAllah, the whole time we're here, every time you drink zamzam, you feel like way more energized yeah. than, than not. But SubhanAllah, man, like the way, the, the twisted view they got yeah. on this. It's because it comes from a, a lens that's lacking severe wisdom. And I don't know, I, I feel like that also plays into the whole liberal secular mentality is that you have to embrace your fullest self and um, like self-identity and everything to do with what you want in terms of your identity and self Mm. completely overrides any sort of like wisdom or guidance. There's no, like nobody can can tell you what to do when it comes to that. And um, 
it, like it's it's hard to also remember but i always tell myself that like i know in in the in the short lens or the short mm. picture this seems unfair or seems discriminatory by nature or seems whatever mm. but then behind the scenes which we'll, we'll never know of or whatever like or even if you do really think about it and do research and, and whatever mm. it's always about for the benefit of the like the communal benefit or yeah. for the benefit of building functional healthy societies and it's right. for right it's for like bigger picture benefits only if you're looking at it in, in the lens of the dunya right, right. and so i don't know I, I always think about how the one thing in our life that we're like okay just be uncomfortable for a short while or be uncomfortable or be disciplined because the the outcomes are much more beneficial is just health health and fitness that's like i feel like one of the the few (laughs) things where we're like where we're like i know you want to eat it but you know just don't right now or be like uh like be disciplined or whatever exercise or this and that whatever because you because like it's the only time you can deny yourself yeah exactly it's the only thing it's the only temptation you can deny because you know that in the long run it's gonna uh and not even long run like in the short run it's gonna result in in much better either superficial results or health results right? right and so that's the one thing that you can deny right but when it when it comes to like other aspects of yourself because Ultimately, like this is something I struggled with a lot in terms of ideologies and whether you're born a certain way or not, like nature versus nurture and whatever. Mm. But like ultimately, even if you're like born with something or you're socialized into it, like at the end of the day, it's a choice that you make to succumb to something or not to succumb to something or to to engage in a way of life or not to engage in a way of life. And like it's that choice that comes from you deciding against your temptations or basically ascribing to like god's wisdom and god's rules or just you're giving into your indulgences right yeah. and so i don't know for me i know like this is a totally different analogy and you're oversimplifying something and whatever but how come you we don't approach food this way like just just live like just give in just you know do yeah, it and whatever it's interesting it's like you're right like the, the communal aspect is gone yeah and everything is so hyper individualized so yeah. yeah and indiv- individualistic to the point that like it's like it's like well this is better for society it doesn't is not an argument it's like society should bend yeah to what it benefits me yeah everything should bend to what benefits exactly me, yeah right? and it's kind of dangerous way to run like how do you it run is, yeah how do you run a society like that it doesn't yeah. work right everybody has to make sacrifices for the greater good right yeah um yeah i mean I know it's it's, it's very scary difficult. like where people are going this, this one article somebody posted I think a few people were posting it online today yeah or this one woman like basically being like yeah just because he's a prophet doesn't mean he's a good person oh I didn't see that yeah it's just like someone today it's like yeah this furthering it's the same thing like a Muslim feminist yeah. person writing this and it's like yeah man like you just it makes you feel so conflicted on this issue right yeah um and then you get these voices that are like out there who are like, we should be against feminism in its totality because yeah, exactly. of this reason. Because exactly. these are the voices that it's coming out of. Yeah. And, and Well, I guess article writers like that are, are what fuel these arguments, right? Yeah. Like, They're like, oh, just because just the prophet, just because God made him a prophet doesn't mean he's a good person. Yeah. And so therefore we can still accuse him of being a patriarchal person. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what religion do you have yeah. if the prophet Muhammad is not going to be your example? There's yeah. no religion. He's not a good person, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's disheartening. Re- like. It is, yeah. I don't know. It's really tough. Every time I think about this stuff, I'm like, "Oh, can you bring children <laughs> into this world when you have honestly, no guarantee?" Honestly, but I don't know. And then sometimes I think about it in terms of like in the con- in the context of liberal secularism and comedy. I'm mm. like, you know, when me starting comedy and like Mama giving me dirty looks earlier and whatever, <laughs> but like Mama and Baba were just shook, like shooketh, like they were like how could this possibly be right and i'm just like how are you what world are you living that you were so like that kind of removed from who i am or whatever um Mm -hmm. that this came as such a shock to you right like how like Mm -hmm. why is that right and and not even in terms of you know let's say the comedy places that i go to or whatever but just in terms of like making jokes itself or comedy and and all of that and then i was like what are my kids gonna come to me with that's gonna just completely blindside me that I'll never <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like yeah. 
And so and then that also sends me into a downward spiral of like rabbit hole <laughs> of scary thoughts. But yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean I guess at the end of the day you have to just kind of be like, Okay, I'm gonna do my best, but they are their own individuals and like it's up to God how you know how they can turn out and stuff like that. I don't know. I think I think like your treatment of parents was like plays a big part of how your kids come out. For sure, yeah. for sure. But like and uh you can also do your absolute best and for, yeah definitely yeah, um so i don't know but you know i talked about it in another podcast with hamza tortoise yeah to Zortis. Zortis, yeah like i said right that like <laughs> the arguments you have against your parents are really like a reflection of the arguments you have against yourself interesting because that like every time you argue about your parents about something you're like you're just trying to blame them for your own failing okay you know what i mean yeah like you're angry that you're a selfish person so then you're arguing with your parents because you think that you're the re- they're the reason that you came out selfish oh okay 100 percent. you don't you don't yeah. want to you don't want to you're like you're the reason take I responsibility have yeah, for totally, totally. the decisions that you've made you just kind of want to throw it all on your parents right? yeah but I, I think a really big part of it is in the fact that our parents really embrace and love at least like <clears throat> in my experience love to like have not total control over your decisions but love to have a really big say in your decisions and a really big say in like your individual individuality or like your relationship with god and stuff like that so then um when it comes time for you to like remove them from that if you if you disagree Mm -hmm. then um that really enhances those types of arguments because it's like I need you to validate me, but also no, because I'm my own person. But also, like, this is what I'm used to. I need to, like, lean on you as a crutch. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's like, that's another thing where, like, kind of, for me, it was a really big thing, like, realizing I have an individual relationship with God. And it's, like, uh, you know, you, like, you try and get their advice and everything and all of that. But at the end of the day, like, you're going to be held accountable for your actions. So, whether good or bad you know what i mean so mm-hmm. i don't know but that's interesting i have to listen to that podcast episode yeah i don't know why i let you be on my podcast <laughs> when i haven't heard any of them exactly <laughs> um yeah so anyways well this is pretty good i think yeah i have enough content for I something wa- i wanted to go to the roda but it's looking like it's gonna have to be after fudge yeah yeah i don't know if i can go now yeah. i'm supposed to go in a couple hours inshallah <laughs> try okay. again sounds good all right we'll have you on in the real studio at some point oh yeah true inshallah okay but sounds good well, thanks for doing this okay thanks for having me <laughs> in the same room <laughs> okay, so